I don't know if it matters, but there are spoilers in the video. Be aware of that. Good evening. I know it's been a while since I've done a long-form lore video like this, but hey, I'm back with the milk and ready to continue to dig deeper into this video game, because I am not done until every stone has been turned. This time, we're looking a lot deeper into the Iterators, the massive biomechanical supercomputers that are the main landmarks of Rain World's terrain. We're going to be going over their basic lore for a little bit, but then we'll be diving into their anatomy, which will take the most time, to describe all that goes on within an iterator superstructure that we know of and what can happen to it and when things start to go wrong. Let's not waste any more time and get into it, we have quite a lot of ground to cover. Starting off, a quick description of what iterators are. An iterator is a biomechanical supercomputer engineered by the Ancients with the purpose of solving the great problem. Look at my big lore summary for more information about the Ancients if you haven't seen it already. Iterators are massively intelligent to a downright incomprehensible level. Their circuits are so complicated and exist in such massive bulk, the structures that house them are large enough to comfortably fit a city on top of. We don't know much about how long they've been milling about after the Ancients went and vanished, but we do know that they are the only living entities who can tell us about their creator society. Well, I guess the echoes count, but I don't think they, they're really, like, living, but who knows. Anyway, in terms of what goes on in their heads, iterators, despite being robotic deities more or less, have a surprising amount of humanity, capable of experiencing complex emotions and having conversations with beings that are significantly less intelligent than them. They communicate with each other over long distance using a variety of communication networks and seem to be inherently social. By that I mean they tend to seek out companionship to fill the void, and will have conversations about seemingly meaningless things simply to pass the time. All in all, they're a lot more human than one would expect, whatever your definition of human is. It's not too, too important to understand how iterators function on an emotional level, that's more covered in the lore summaries and iterator logs. We're mostly here to talk about their anatomy and theorize on how they function on a biological level. So before we start uh, naming pieces, let's discuss a few very important things about iterator functionality. First off, their water reliance. Water is effectively the only resource iterators need to exist. It's used to flush out toxins and slag, hydrate the biological components, and, as mentioned, cool their systems when they overheat. All iterators rely on water above all else and will die in a matter of cycles if left completely parched. The second thing to discuss is the nature of iterators as biological entities compared to mechanical ones. This is a dubious topic because it's never out and out stated how much of an iterator is mechanical versus how much of them is biological, so we're mostly just left to guess. My theory is that iterators are mostly biological, but have structures built of metal. Every iterator room that we see effectively uses metal as a skeleton, a framework for the soft tissue that calculates things to be stuffed in between. This is entirely just a vibe that I get, because the ancients have been stated to use purposed organisms inside of metal boxes before. I imagine that iterators and their processors are just a super massive example of that. Perhaps they're fully biological and just look metal, but ultimately we kind of can't tell. The final thing to discuss before moving on are iterator cities. More accurately, I want to say that we're not going to be talking about them. Iterator cities are not part of the Iterator complex, they exist secondarily to it and atop it. There are evidently no connections between Five Pebbles and his city in the biological sense. Even the very Iterator-esque House of Braids uses a different gravity generator and different mechanical components from ones found within Pebbles. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but realistically I assume this is the case because the innards of the Iterator are very clearly sectioned off from the city buildings, as we were told in lore that the cities were built atop pre-existing Iterators, rather than alongside the Iterator construction from the start. Anyways, let's start off with the most obvious parts of an Iterator's anatomy first, the Puppet and the Puppet Chamber. Starting out with the Chamber, since it's uh, simpler. The Puppet Chamber is a large, cube-shaped room with sloped corners and evenly sized walls on all sides. Each wall is adorned with square and rectangular tiles that interlock to form a generally very uniform-looking room. The room is about uh, 10 to 12 slug cats tall and wide, very useful measuring system, with no notable features outside of the iterator puppet and the umbilical that connects it to the room. Puppet chambers lie in the upper middle part of the superstructure, and are connected with an access shaft to the top of the structure. Five Pebbles has an entrance to the rest of his facility and an access shaft, making for two entrances at the top of his chamber, whereas Moon only has one entrance. Moving on to the puppet, starting with the umbilical. The umbilical is what connects the iterator puppet to the structure. It is a single, multi-jointed robotic limb that connects to a square-shaped port that can scoot along the walls of the puppet chamber. The limb itself appears to be capable of holding the puppet up with and without the zero-gravity environment of the rest of the can. 
It can also be damaged to an extent where it cannot hold up the puppet, in which case it will act as a tether, keeping the Ed Raider puppet in place and sometimes even forcing them to stay seated due to the weight as seen with looks to the moon. Now for the big cheese, the Iderator puppet. The puppet appears to be the center of the consciousness of an Iderator, but that's honestly arguable. In my opinion, the puppet is capable of individual thought when supplied with neurons for at least a notable period of time due to what we see with Moon. The puppet was likely created for the purpose of having a face and body to interact with, otherwise the ancients would just be talking to a wall. However. The puppet does seem to be a central identity for the Iderators, with them utilizing the puppet to think and emote even when they are completely alone. I like to imagine that the central identity of an Iderator is more or less just their puppet. Much like how humans are very attached to their own face, Iderators would very likely be attached to their own puppet. Anyways, on to the physical appearance. Iderator puppets have relatively stout humanoid figures. They appear to have smooth, soft skin that can be in various colors from green to blue to red. Their eyes are large, black, and expressionless, with their puppets having no expressive muscles to be found on their face. Additionally, all Iderators have little metal fixtures, or using the professional term, doinkers, on either side of their head where the human ears would be placed. They appear to have antenna that can go upwards, or optionally, they just have little metal nubs with no obvious antenna sprouting from them. Most Iderator puppets also have patterns painted onto their foreheads, as well as wires coming down from the backs of their heads, which connect to the umbilical port on their middle back. Most Iderator puppets are dressed simply in a colored shawl that goes past their legs. The only one to have another obvious clothing item would be no significant harassment and his scarf. Honestly, I think that's it for the Iderator puppet, though. We know little about their innate biology, like what lies under the skin, so I won't comment on it because I don't want to add more headcanons to my lore videos because then the Rainworld subreddit complains about me and I cry into my pillow at night. Anyways, ignoring that, we talked about the arguable brain of the Iderator structure, even though the whole thing is the brain. I suppose the puppet could be considered more like the frontal lobe of the brain? Eh, it's not that important. Anyway, let's move on to the arguably veins of the Iderator, the conduits. Also known as the lymphatic drainage system, the conduits are what keeps an iterator functional, providing water to all parts of the superstructure and also assisting with flushing out slag and other toxins from the processors. Unfortunately, the only time we ever get to see the conduits in-game is in The Rot, where they are not exactly in working order. Despite this, we see that they contain multiple biomechanical fronds that are likely used similarly to the villi and the human intestine, absorbing the water and nutrients in the water to nurture the biological aspects of the processors. It could also be that these biomechanical fronds are used to probe the water to make sure there aren't any impurities and to give the Iderator knowledge on the water quality in that part of the superstructure. Either works. Throughout this area, we even spot neuron flies, though that could be because of the obvious disrepair of the superstructure causing them to accidentally get lost in the conduits. Conduits are found all throughout the rot, suggesting that they are a constant no matter where you are in the Iderator superstructure, weaving their way around every system that needs water to function, so every system. Once the water is done being utilized by the superstructure, it seemingly is vaporized and exit out of some of the large steam vents on the side of the iterator in massive quantities to rain down on the landscape below later. Next up is the heart. Likely near the center of the iterator superstructure, the heart is the central power source of the entire iterator superstructure. Though we only ever see it flooded and inactive in Moon's submerged superstructure, it could be that the heart is meant to be flooded, but there's no way to really properly know. It would make sense for it to be connected to the conduits, considering the rooms that connect to the heart we see in Moon. Additionally, the rarefaction room floods when powered on, suggesting this is how it's meant to be, but there's really no way to properly know, considering the extensive damage and flooding that we see in submerged superstructure. The heart contains five nodes, four of which are likely gravity control nodes or auxiliary power sources, and one of which we know contains the central rarefaction cell that grants power to the entire superstructure. Oh yeah, I probably should define what a rarefaction cell is actually. A rarefaction cell is a device that utilizes contained void fluid to produce energy through a procedure that I don't recall is defined. But if I had to put money on it, I'd say that void fluid dissolving things and deleting them from existence likely produces a hefty chunk of energy that can be harnessed under the right circumstances. Now, if how rare faction cells is ever actually explained directly in game, I can't find it, so I'm just gonna hope that I'm right. Anyway, rare faction cells distort time and space around them, and are seemingly the reason for the gravity distortions in an iterator superstructure, as well as providing backup power to their entire system. The rarefaction cell in the heart is responsible for likely the entirety of the central power grid of an iterator's systems. If I had to guess, I'd wager that the conduits are supposed to flood the heart, constantly making sure that no impurities reach it and allowing for the water to flow to every part of the facility. It also makes sense for the whole veins comparison. Veins connect to the heart, it just works. But making theories based on shit that just makes sense has not taken me far in Rainroad speculations, so uh, who knows? 
All right, next up, the General Systems Bus. If we're keeping with the whole body part comparison, this is kind of like the spinal cord of the Iterator. The General Systems Bus is a relatively short section of the superstructure that connects to the puppet systems to the rest of the systems. Thus, it's the bus that provides connection to the general systems. Wow, ain't that crazy. Anyway, in-game, it is, it, it is kind of fucking crazy in terms of appearance. Constantly projecting varying symbols onto the back and blaring random gods in your ears the entire time you're there. Not that I'm complaining, it's quite cool and it makes sense considering this is where a large portion of the information moving through an iterator is transported to and from. I guess in that way it would be less like the spinal cord and more like the brainstem actually, but hey, they're connected. So it's not strictly wrong. Anyways, uh, the general systems bus doesn't have too much in it besides an abundance of these wiggly dudes, which we'll talk about more later when we get into the inhabitants of the iterator internals. Besides that, the general systems bus is really simple. It's literally just the tube from which all the important stuff goes to and from. So every time we talk about a system now, imagine that it's connected to the general systems bus and that's how it gives data to the puppet chamber. Next up is the memory conflux, which uh, is definitely the start of some sort of vague trend. That trend being areas that are only vaguely defined and have nonsense names, which makes them very hard to determine the purpose of. Uh, let's start by looking at that name, huh? Memory conflux. A conflux is a term that defines the merging of multiple individual things into one, and a memory is likely referring to computer memory rather than the more defined human memory that we experience. So a memory conflux defines the place where the computer's memory is brought together to do something, likely a basic task. Iterator's tasks are often experimentation, cataloging, or whatever the fuck they get up to. So it could be simply that the memory conflux is just where all the shit gets done. It's a great big expanse that contains the many different basic processing functions of an iterator. We see this theory mirrored a little bit in game. The memory complex is a sterile white series of square connected rooms akin to test chambers, where important things could be done separately from the rest of the computer components. I suppose important things like the assembly and monitoring of these funky little red grids created and looked over to by these funky little white spider dudes. I don't know what their deal is or why these red grids are so important as to take up a wide majority of the explorable memory complex rooms, but good on them for having an important job. I wish them the best. Next up is a much more uh, easy to parse subregion, the recursive transform arrays. Recursive defines the constant repetition of a certain thing, so recursive transform arrays just means that there's a lot of very similar transform arrays hanging out in this same area. But what is a transform array? Well, it likely refers to electrical transformers or something of the sort, which are electrical devices designed to carry electrical currents from one circuit to another. In game, the transform arrays are shown to be a series of wide rooms filled with electric coils that occasionally get charged with bright blue arcing electricity that is more than enough to kill anything that touches them. The purpose of the transform arrays is likely to either store the excess electricity produced by the rarefaction cells or to produce a more stable power source as the rarefaction cells are stated to be a backup source, meaning that the primary power source is probably the transform arrays. Either way, there's not much else to say about the transform arrays. They are important, they produce and or store a lot of electricity. But uh, let's move on, I don't got all day. Alright, what's next? Oh boy, the abstract convergence manifold. This will be so easy to explain. Abstract refers to something that is not present in physical, concrete, easy-to-explain forms, and a convergence manifold is just a lot of convergences, which are the same thing as confluxes. So, it's a hard-to-define series of things coming together. We get nothing from this. It, in game, it doesn't tell us much either. The rooms here are unique, but kind of hard to parse in terms of what their functions are. They're just dark rooms that vary in size from relatively small to biggest in the entire game, all with a vaguely blue tint. I got nothing for this. Probably just some more strange, important neural stuff for processing abstract information if I had to wager a guess. It's also important to mention that in Looks to the Moon, there are areas that are almost mirrored to five pebbles just named differently. For example, Moon's General Systems Bus is called the Neural Terminus, despite literally being the General Systems Bus. So it could be that this is just a renamed Five Pebbles area, but the only one that would make sense is Memory Conflux, but Moon also just has a Memory Conflux, so I got nothing. Alright, we're chugging through these. Time for the final area with a weird name that we have to go through the dictionary to understand. This area is the Linear Systems Rail, and honestly, well, it's not that hard to parse. It's a rail, which in computers is defined as a line that contains a single type of voltage, so it would be the rail that supplies power to the linear systems, which are just systems that are non-complex and have relatively simple, straightforward processes to fulfill. This theory is given some more legs to stand on when you look at the linear systems rail in game. It's literally just a straight line, a rail, connected to a refaction cell, which gives power. So I'm right, and if you doubt me, you will be cast into the deep black pits of Tartarus to suffer for eternity with the titans of old, or something. 
Judging from the fact that Five Pebble starts to die when the rarefaction cell is removed, it could be that the aforementioned linear systems are the ones that are powered by Moon's heart to some extent. So the linear systems could be the ones that power the transferring of water from place to place, the acquisition and spreading of power to different areas. Basically, the normal systems that would equate to the systems humans have for breathing and pumping blood. That's more or less all for the named functional in iterator internals that we see, but there's some more stuff to talk about first. One of those things labeled under stuff is one specific broadcast that tells us a scary amount about iterator functionality. It's found in Spearmaster and reads as this. Live broadcast, equipment manifest, wide sweep diagnostic results, water 45%, hydrocarbons 105%, sulfur 1210%, silicon 410%, phosphates 65%. Severe chemical imbalance. Request fluid transplantation immediately. Warning. No water flow detected in conduits 3, 4, 7, 9, 13, 18, 19, 21, 22, 23. Pressure at critical levels in conduit 4. Rapid cooling will be immediately scheduled for affected nodes. However, quantities of slag runoff may reach dangerous levels. Critical system-wide activities should be temporarily suspended to prevent retroactive damage from resulting seismic shocks. Rapid cooling is a preventative regulation only. Emergency maintenance is required. So, what's to say about this? First off, we get a bulleted list of the main things that iterators need, and more importantly, what the unhealthy levels of them are. Water is obvious. Hydrocarbons are, by definition, a chemical compound that forms the basis for almost all fossil fuels used in today's world, from oil to coal to natural gas. So it likely just refers to combustible fuel. Cool, didn't realize iterators ran off of oil burners. Realistically, it's probably just hydrocarbons that can be thrown into their rarefaction cells to catalyze the reaction. Sulfur is the most obviously unhealthy one. Sulfur is not exactly a material conducive to life. So I could imagine that it's a large part of the poison that's killing Moon, and likely the main thing that needs to be flushed out with the water she's running out of. Silicon is also at a higher level than is presumably healthy. Silicon is a strange addition if we're going off the idea that iterators are mostly biological, as our bodies don't use silicon for much besides connective tissue. But why would Moon have an excess of silicon? What in Moon produces a large amount of silicon to the extent where it would build up without water to flush it out? I'm not sure. I can imagine other people who are a bit more knowledgeable on the subject will have a bit more to say about it. As for phosphates, though, they are incredibly important. Phosphorus is an element needed in almost all biological processes. It facilitates almost all cell growth, repair, and replacement. A low level of phosphates means that Moon is likely incapable of fixing any of the issues, or at least is running out of materials to do so. As for the other lines, though, the requesting of fluid transplantation is likely a desperate cry for more clean water. The water in Moon is ridiculously low in quantity and ridiculously high in impurities. It's likely that Conduit 4 is where it's all being held, as that conduit has no water flow and very high pressure, which means that that's probably where all the shit water is being kept, and not being dumped. Letting this water go would be helpful, but it's also the only water she has in her system, so doing so would be dooming herself to overheating. It seems that the main process to fix this rather unfortunate issue that she's having is rapid cooling, which is only a temporary solution, or a preventative regulation, I suppose, using the game's own words. We don't actually know what rapid cooling is when it comes to iterator superstructures, so we can't theorize much on it. What we do know is that it produces a lot of slag runoff, and Moon collapses primarily due to slag runoff, which implies that the rapid cooling she chooses to undergo is what dooms her. This transmission is overall exceedingly helpful when it comes to understanding the way that iterators work. I couldn't exactly think of another place to put it in the script though, so I'm shoving it in between the two different sections here and hoping it works. Anyways, let's talk about what lives in iterator superstructures now. First off, we have the stuff we've already talked about, the neuron flies and inspectors. We spoke about them in the Flora Fauna remaster a whole year ago, but let's quickly go over what they are here. Neuron flies are simple entities that serve as the main processors within the iterator superstructure. They can be seen flying about the zero gravity infrastructure, carrying signals from place to place. Their main function seems to be as well a neuron, a brain cell, a signal carrier. They seem so good at this that a number of them can even be seen keeping Moon's puppet conscious, even when completely disconnected from the rest of the superstructure. They also appear to be edible, and cause slug cats to glow brightly upon consuming one. Now on to the inspectors. These creatures are quite large and take up the task of defending the iterator internals from any threats. Anything that would eat a neuron fly will incur their wrath. 
They used their three large dexterous limbs to toss spears with surprising speed and accuracy at any perpetrator. Otherwise, they're seemingly made up of the same stuff as overseers, which we're not going to talk about, being a mainly holographic body with a pearl or eye as the central processor. Now, onto the stuff we haven't talked about, the more esoteric and unnamed things found in Iterator internals. First off, these weird red dudes. I'm not sure what to call them. I guess like neuron bundles or something like that? They might have a name in the files I could use, but I ain't looking for that, so someone tell me if they do. These guys exist all over the place, which means they could really do anything. Generally, though, they only show up where the neuron flies are. If I had to guess, I'd imagine they serve as a connection point for the neuron flies to work around. But again, as with all of these unnamed dudes, I'm not really sure. Next up are those funky little white spider dudes that work on the red grids in the memory complex. These dudes have a pretty well-defined purpose, build and maintain those things. You can see them doing it, it's really neat. I'm not too sure why they're doing what they're doing, but they seem to have fun doing it. Good for them. Next up is a bit more of an easy-to-imagine entity. These weird little whiskers found all over the place, but mainly in the conduits. We've already talked about the ones found in the conduits. They're likely designed to test water or grab it like the cilia on the inside of our intestinal walls. But what about the ones that are outside of it? What about the whiskers that sit on all the iterator structure walls? Honestly, I'm not really certain. It could absolutely be that they are sensors, though, designed to detect or to simply be, like, methods for the neuron flies to connect into the walls. We see a lot of those. But again, they're only ever really found in small rooms on their own, so I ultimately don't really have any idea what the other ones are. Second to last, we have these real big tentacles found in the memory conflux in General Systems Bus. These guys are also fairly explicable. They can be seen fulfilling some sort of obvious function. They interface with the neuron flies. I'm not sure what they're talking about, but the neuron flies will go to the bristly ends of these dudes and do some with them, then fly off. This means that these guys can probably carry some sort of important signal. I'm not sure what they do, but they do something, which is more than the red tendrils at least. Okay, our final creature is here, and it's not supposed to be. It's time we talk about the rot. If every other part of the iterator that we've discussed so far is an organ, or some sort of cell, the rot is a tumor. Or, I suppose, just cancer. Now, not even an exaggeration. It's, it's just cancer. The rot is heavily implied to be the result of an experiment to make a genome to rewrite the genetic code of an iterator to allow for one to circumvent the self-destruction taboo. This experimental genome ended up being a malignant, tumorous mass that began to voraciously consume the interior of the iterator structure and aggressively multiply. The rot takes on many forms, each one seeming to be a stage of the rot's life cycle. Starting out, the rot is a hive organism, each individual cell being its own organism, like a siphonophore. Or honestly, probably more like just a mold, like a slime mold. That would probably work better, I use siphonophores too much in my analyses. These individual organisms that make up the rot form into a blackish film at first that consumes like a mold, eventually forming bulb-like cysts that assist it in consuming larger prey. This form is known as a proto-long legs. These cysts take on a color based on what the cysts have been eating. In an iterator, this color is often blue or some other fluorescent color, but it takes on a more dull green as it lives outside the iterator. Or maybe that's just a garbage waste thing. When a cyst grows large enough, it will eventually split off and begin to utilize an array of long tentacles to move itself around, a mobile form. These will either be mother or daddy long legs, depending on how big the cyst was when it split off. Over time, this cyst will starve and shrink down to a brother long legs, a much weaker form. I'm being very brief on the concept of the rot, as it's fairly simple. If you want a more advanced summary, it's, it's in Downpour Flora Fauna. The rot is more or less just iterator cancer. It can seemingly spread and become mobile, able to consume, and being a threat so major it almost completely destroys five pebbles can by the end of Saint. It's not unlikely that, similar to humans, the rot is the main threat to an iterator's continuous functionality. The other iterators seem to tell us that the rot is not an unknown thing exclusive to five pebbles. The mere fact that it's a named threat mentioned by a mostly unrelated iterator proves that. It could be that the rot itself is not just the cancerous masses that we see in Five Pebbles, but any form of biological, cancerous, malignant disease that can affect an iterator superstructure. I feel like I should be saying more about the rot that we see. It's arguably the main antagonist of the goddamn game, but it's literally just robot cancer. There's nothing super complex about it. Anyways, that wraps up the inside of an iterator, so how about we talk about the outside? Let's just get through this. Let's start from the top. No, literally. The top of the iterator can. The very top of the iterator superstructure contains two things. One is a big fat load of nothing, and the second is a city. 
which we won't talk about. The top of around that city it seems to be mostly just a flat landscape of what looks to be either dirt or sand, and a few trenches throughout it to allow access to the facility below. As you reach the edge of the superstructure though, things get a little bit more interesting. At the edge of the superstructure there's a small lip, and then a sheer drop down the side of the can. This area is known as the Wall, and contains mostly just a thoroughly greebled mess of sci-fi machiny stuff you gotta climb up or down. But it's notably the first time that we see these things, the balls. Well, ball singular for now. This thing, a metal sphere with two radio antennae extending from the top and bottom of it. There's only one of these on the wall, but my guess is that these hollow spheres are meant to gather weather data and transmit it. This one is ver likely very different from the other ones we see though. It might just be a radio installation, but I struggle to see why these would be on the side as opposed to in the city if it's a radio installation. As we near the bottom of the wall, we curve beneath the structure to the underhang, or as it's properly called, the vents. This name is found in Moon's superstructure and is a lot more proper, as it confirms that this is where the steam from the boiled water is vented out of the superstructure. The rain here is different, and it takes the form of greenish electrical sparks that bolt around and fling the slug cat about. This greenish electricity is a constant throughout Iterator structures. I didn't exactly mention it up until now, but yeah, that's what powers them. Though it's blue in the recursive transformer arrays, you can see it in the green way in the top of the rod area near the neural terminus zapping about, and it's even visible on the working iterator cans in the far distance, crackling beneath them. My guess is that these green sparks in the underhang are either static caused by the utter amount of steam being let out at the end of a cycle, or simply just a natural discharge of the energy from the capacitors. I'm not sure why that would be happening, but it would make sense with the coloration as we only ever see the green energy around iterator cans. Besides that, the vents are mostly a series of downwards facing vents and other machinery that manages the steam output. Though there are a bunch more of the balls down here, many of them small in the background, but three of them large enough to explore. I have a theory that these are monitoring machines utilized to test the steam output and make sure nothing is going wrong with it. It would make sense with the placement, but I'm not sure. I can't think of what else they would be used for. The underhang also just has another stated purpose, but we don't really see how it does it, which is dumping. Not just steam venting, but dumping. Dumping is when an iterator wants to remove a large portion of solid material from their superstructure. The entire existence of the garbage waste is a result of dumping. I'm not sure how they do it, I imagine it's like throwing shit you don't want out the window, just mulch it and route it through a chute and let it fall. Anyway, as we move downwards we reach the furthest extremity of an iterator superstructure, the legs, or the struts. The legs we see in game are very, very simple. They're just a large series of connected rooms that go up a long metal strut made mostly of vertical poles and support beams. The purpose of which is rather easy to estimate, it's to elevate the structure above the ground and keep it elevated. I'm sure there's a bevy of reasons as to why it needs to be elevated, and hey, the legs do their job, but that's about it. Overall, the entire exterior of an iterator structure is very simple. It's just a series of extremities for either collecting data or connecting to other iterators, or venting out shit that doesn't need to be in the main body. As such, it's just a mess of greebling, which if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's one of my favorite words. Alrighty, that's more or less it. A complete discussion of everything we know about the functionality of iterators. If I missed anything, feel free to let me know in the comments. Lord knows I'm good at missing things in my analyses, so I encourage everyone to go down there and look at the people who are probably smarter than me. Besides that, though, that's all for today. I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye